Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first in our series of A Book Observed in 2022. Uh, for those of you who have enjoyed this series, welcome back. Uh, as you know, we've done a number of books with Dr. Jerry Root, and then we followed that up with the uh, Chronicles of Narnia with Dr. Joe Rigney, and we're excited to launch on our next series on the Space Trilogy. Uh, my name is Carl Johnson. I'm the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute in Chicago, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening. Real quick, just a couple words about the C.S. Lewis Institute before we start. If you're unfamiliar with who we are, um, we are a ministry that has been around since 1976, and we exist to develop disciples of Jesus Christ um, in the legacy of C.S. Lewis, who can articulate, defend, live, and share their faith in Jesus Christ, both pers personally and uh, publicly. And so we do this through a variety of ways. We run something called the C.S. Lewis Fellows Program, which is a one-year discipleship program that actually starts in June, and we're accepting applications for this tuition-free program right now. So if you check our website, you can look for one of the 17 cities where we uh, have um, institute chapters and apply for the program there. We do uh, uh, seminars and conferences, and now we do webinars thanks to COVID-19. And uh, tonight is just such an example. So uh, we hope that uh, this um, evening is not only uh, enjoyable, but it's also edifying because we are really looking for more than just uh, entertainment and fun. We also want it to build us up in our faith. And uh, we're confident that tonight will do that. It'll be both a learning experience, but also it will help us uh, plumb the depths of some of the things Lewis has to say through a work like uh, Space Trilogy. As you know, Lewis can speak on multiple levels. So um, also we do this, as I said, the fellows programs tuition free. We offer these free, but if you're uh, so inclined, we would love your support. Obviously these all um, require resources. And so as the Lord leads you, would you consider going to our website and uh, supporting the work of the C.S. Lewis Institute? Um, so without much further ado, I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Bill Smith from Atlanta. He's my counterpart there. He's the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute in Atlanta, and he's going to be guiding us through this evening uh, with Dr. David Downing. So, Bill, please take it away. Yes, welcome to all of you. I enjoy these. Uh, we we find that there are people from actually from all over the world. So, uh, welcome. And some of you who've not been uh, before, I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, we'll have uh, some comments, uh, a little bit of presentation from now, from time to time, and then uh, opportunity for you to send in uh, questions or comments. And so, uh, as as uh, KJ mentioned, I'm the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute in Atlanta. If you're in the Atlanta area or North Georgia even, uh, you can contact me about uh, any of our events and registering for different events uh, tonight. We have the pleasure of uh, hosting Out of the Silent Planet, the first of uh, the Space Trilogy or the Ransom Trilogy. And uh, I'm looking forward to this myself, uh, just having listened and read uh, over the past couple of weeks uh, Out of the Silent Planet. And so with that, I want to invite uh, our guest this evening, uh, Dr. David Downing, to join me. And uh, so, David, we're, we're glad that you can be with us. Uh, I'm in Atlanta and you're in Chicago and you were just talking about uh, the weather in Chicago. So you're right. It's snowing here right now. So uh, it's uh, feeling a little bit like uh, the uplands of Malacandra right here. A little bit cold and dark. Yeah. Yeah. That's a contrast, of course, to Atlanta, as I mentioned, 68 degrees. Well, hey, David, uh, I introduced myself. Now, if you if you would uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from. Uh, what you're doing there at the uh, Wade Center. And then uh, after that, I'll uh, lead us into more specific uh, discussion about Out of the Silent Planet. Okay. Thanks, Bill. I'm happy to join you all. Uh, I'm David Downing. I uh, grew up in Colorado. My father worked for the Navigators, Jim Downing. He was the uh, oldest survivor of the attack on Pearl Harbor. So he's kind of a local celebrity. There's a bridge named after my dad, Jim Downing, in Colorado Springs. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, obviously, uh, but the people were good-hearted but often accepted fairly simple answers to difficult questions. So when I went off to college uh, at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, I was struggling with my faith. It just seemed like kind of an intellectual straitjacket. 
And in my first year, I was teaching a course on, I was taking a course on modern novel. And the professor said, uh, one of the books is not available. It's out of print. Does it, do any of you have a, a modern novel you'd like to add to the reading list? And one of my fellow students said, I wish you could read C.S. Lewis's Paralandra. And I had never read anything by Lewis growing up. And uh, so Paraland, we're going to talk about in the next session, but it was a real eye opener for me. It was science fiction or fantasy. It takes place on another world, but it was full of theological insight. It really asked you to rethink your faith, to rethink the nature of fall, the nature of sin. And I couldn't believe that such a expansive theology and such an exalted view of God could be embedded in a science fiction novel. So ironically, the student who suggested the book left at Christmas and went back home. So we just had this very small overlap. Uh, Charles William called that holy luck. I was introduced to Paralandra by the recommendation of a fellow student. The professor hadn't read the book either. So I graduated from Westmont. I met my wife there, Crystal, who is the co-director of the Wade Center. Uh, I got a PhD at UCLA. And um, I was talking to my advisor one day, who was a Christian. And I said, you know, we have this canon of famous English authors such as James Joyce and Virginia Woolf and D.H. Lawrence. But I think C.S. Lewis could hold his own as a literary figure. I, I said, I don't think the Ransom Trilogy is just um, holiday reading or airport reading. I think it's serious literature that can be studied. And he said, well, you ought to write a book about that. So I waited several years for someone more qualified to step forward. And no one did. So I wrote a book called Planets in Peril, a critical study of the Ransom Trilogy. And so that was my entree into the world of C.S. Lewis studies. There it is right there. Uh, I like to call it the Ransom Trilogy because most of the action takes place on planets. It doesn't take place in space. And also, as we'll talk about later, Lewis critiques the idea of space, that it's just vast and dark and empty. He liked the medieval idea of the heavens, that it's radiant and full of life. So uh, I wrote this book first. I taught at Westmont for a while and then Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. My wife is a Sayers scholar, Dorothy Sayers, the detective novelist and also a lay theologian. So we were invited four years ago to come to the Wade Center at Wheaton College, which is the world's preeminent archive for seven British Christian authors, Lewis, Tolkien, Dorothy Sayers, uh, Owen Barfield, Charles Williams, George MacDonald, and uh, G.K. Chesterton. So we've really enjoyed being at the Wade Center, not only for our own research, but because of all the wonderful people we meet coming and going from the Wade. I like to say you'll come for the books, but you'll stay for the people. It's a fascinating fellowship of folks gathered around the Wade Center and Wheaton College. Yeah, if you haven't been to the Wade Center, I, I highly encourage you to visit there and um, even take some time to do some of the reading that you can you can uh, be exposed to there. Um, and I jokingly tell people uh, there are relics there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, and uh, David, my first exposure to your writing was actually uh, the most reluctant convert. And All right. mm -hmm. uh, I found that uh, a very fascinating. Just say a word about that, uh, that book. Well, when I read the other biographies, I thought the most fascinating part of Lewis's uh, life was his journey from atheism in his teens and 20s back to Christianity in his early 30s. So I wrote a book. He called himself the most reluctant convert in his memoir, Surprised by Joy. And so I traced the stages uh, of losing his faith as a child and then getting interested in occultism and then being a strict materialist and then looking at philosophical idealism or pantheism and finally coming to faith when he uh, met J.R. Tolkien and other Christians at Oxford. So it's a study of his spiritual journey back to faith that he had had as a child. And uh, there is a play called Most Reluctant Convert. Max McLean picked the same phrase out of Surprise by Joy. And he has an excellent one-man play that's been turned into a movie. The first time I met him, he said, oh, you're the man who wrote a book with the same title as my play. And I said, <laughs> no, you're the man who wrote a play with the same title as my book. Mine came out first. Uh, but they do make it, they complement each other in, in interesting ways. Yeah, great book. Great book. And we used it in the C.S. Lewis Fellows Program one year. Um, and so uh, now to kind of jump in uh, a little bit to Out of the Silent Planet. Um, 
the book was actually published in 1938. I think it's interesting to think about as we get into it, what was going on uh, in Lewis's life in 1938? Well, uh, in the previous year, Lewis and Tolkien, who'd gotten to know each other quite well during the 30s, uh, Lewis said, you know, Tollers, they're not writing the kind of books we like. We like fantasy. We like fiction. We like things with theological or supernatural implications. And so they made a kind of pact that Lewis said, we're going to both write excursionary thrillers. Mine will be based in space and yours will be based in time. So they both started a book. Lewis, uh, Tolkien worked much more uh, um, carefully and slowly than Lewis did. He wrote a book called The Lost Road, which he never finished. He moved on to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. But Lewis wrote Out of the Silent Planet as part of his pact with Tolkien to write a science fiction novel that had theological overtones. Uh, he was reacting. Lewis was kind of a counterpuncher. He would read something that really bothered him. And uh, he once said that good philosophy needs to be practiced if for no other reason than to answer bad philosophy. And he did that not only in his expository books, but also in his fiction. So in the 30s, uh, there was increasing interest in improving the human race. Uh, as Lewis called it evolutionism, which is if uh, single-celled creatures had evolved into animals and then animals had evolved into humans, why couldn't humans take over their own evolution and create supermen or actually gods with a small g? Uh, and he was reading people like J.B.S. Haldane, who's partially the model for Weston in this novel, and Olaf Stapleton, uh, Ray Bradbury, uh, I'm drawing a blank on Arthur C. Clarke. They all felt that, well, obviously there's no external God to save us. If we're gonna put the world in order, we need to evolve ourselves into gods. And there's this eloquent passage in J.B.S. Haldane. He says a thousand years from now, humans will have no sickness. Uh, they may not have to die. They'll be as smart as Plato. They'll be as great as artists as Leonardo da Vinci. They'll be as great as musicians as Bach. And basically, he's describing these supermen, kind of the Nietzschean supermen, but he really meant it seriously. And Lewis said, this is really diabolical. You could justify all manner of, of uh, uh, persecution or uh, abuse of human rights in the name of the improvement of humanity. So he wrote the novel partly because he loved this kind of story, but partly because he wanted to answer the idea that humans should take care of their, or they should take hold of their own evolutionary process. And in many ways, uh, both the Nazis and the uh, Bolsheviks were doing that. They were saying we have to sacrifice a lot of human beings now in order to have a purer race or a more advanced race. And they were both willing to sacrifice millions of lives for their sake of their proposed vision of the future. Neither of their visions came true, but the millions of people they killed uh, were unfortunately really dead. So Lewis did have a thematic uh, backbone to the story. It can be read just as a good adventure story. As a matter of fact, some of the reviewers didn't see the point at all. One of them said, uh, uh, I liked Lewis's writing, but it seems to be written without any particular conviction, which is really an obtuse reading because the whole novel is trying to rehabilitate the the medieval Christian worldview and show how it has this intellectual vitality and an imaginative beauty that most people miss. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, in your in your book, uh, Planets in Peril, um, one of the things that struck me um, was how you pointed out some similarities between uh, Ransom and C.S. Lewis. So uh, what are some of those uh, similarities in as far as their personality or such as that. Right. Uh, well, some people think that Ransom is supposed to represent uh, Tolkien because he was a philologist. But other than that similarity, Ransom is much more like Lewis himself. He's in his late 30s, which Lewis was. Uh, he's he described him as uh, round shouldered and a shabby dresser, which Lewis was famous for being a shabby dresser. People who met him expect this distinguished professor and they thought he looked like a butcher or a farmer. Uh, he wore a lot of his father's old clothes from 30 years earlier. Uh, he also was a Christian. It makes it clear that Ransom's a Christian. Ransom is an anti-vivisectionist. He doesn't believe in scientific experiments on animals. And so, uh, and even this kind of besetting anxiety, uh, Lewis struggled with nightmares and anxiety. And we see that in the character of Ransom. He's always mm -hmm. expecting the worst when he goes on these travels. So I think he's really kind of an alter ego for Lewis more than he is a depiction of Tolkien. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting a little bit later on. We'll we'll talk about uh, fear and how uh, fear enters into the story, and um, and that'll make for some interesting discussion. But uh, just at this point, just uh, give us a brief summary of the plot of Out of the Silent Planet. There may be some folks on, uh, you know, that are with us tonight that either haven't read it or haven't read it in a long time. And so uh, give us a summary of the plot. Okay. Uh, well, Out of the Silent Planet is the story of Elwyn Ransom, and he's a Cambridge philologist on a walking tour by himself. Uh, the first lesson to the novel is you probably shouldn't go on a walking tour by yourself. You should probably have backup. Uh, but he's looking for somewhere to stay for the night, and he encounters a woman who's very concerned because her uh, mentally challenged son hasn't returned home from the, the neighbors where he does some chores. And she asks uh, Ransom to look in on this neighboring house. When Lewis goes there, when Ransom goes there, it's very uh, dark and foreboding. And he meets two men named Weston and Divine. And they're very secretive and very evasive about what's going on with this young boy. And as they talk among themselves, they find out that Ransom is on his own. Nobody knows where he is. No one would would miss him particularly if, if he disappeared. That's another way in which Ransom is like Lewis, that he was not married, did not have children. So they decide to leave the boy alone and to kidnap Ransom and take him off to Malacandra, which we learn as the story goes on is actually Mars. And you can't live on the surface because it's too cold, but the supposed canals of Mars are actually these deep channels like the Grand Canyon. And the inhabitants tend to live down in the channels. Uh, the two men, Weston and Divine, thought that the Malacandrids wanted them to bring another human for either sacrifice or experimentation. They completely misunderstood the nature of the Malacandrians. So Ransom is terrified that he's being taken off to Mars to be some kind of a human sacrifice. Uh, he escapes from his two captors, and he discovers there are three different kinds of creatures on Malacandra, which is Mars, but they all live in harmony. None is trying to conquer the others. None is trying to dominate or govern the others. So he meets the Harasa, which are these otter-like creatures, but they're as tall as humans, but they're uh, smooth and furry and good swimmers. Uh, they're also the poets of that world. Later, he meets the Sorns, which are the, the intellectuals of the world, but also the shepherds. And uh, they, they're they big and lanky and gawky creatures, almost like giant grasshoppers. And uh, thirdly, he meets a, a, a species called the Fiffletrigi, which are these insect-like creatures. And they are the artisans and uh, the uh, sculptors of the planet. And so he mentioned in a letter, he was actually basing uh, Malacandra on Plato's Republic, where you have three different stages, but they all get along in ideal society. Uh, what he least expects is he actually discovers utopia. This is an ordered world where there's no crime, uh, there's no war or violence, and the whole world is being governed by an Oyarsa, which is a kind of uh, archangel or a tutelary spirit who governs the whole planet. So little by little, he discovers that what he thinks of as a very primitive world because it doesn't have big cities, it doesn't have highways, it doesn't have an infrastructure. He actually discovers that theologically they're much more advanced than people on Earth are. They're in right relationship with Meleldil, who's the, uh, the god of the universe, the creator of the universe. Uh, eventually, he has to show up, and uh, one of the uh, other men uh, shoots one of the Harasa, one of the Malacandrians, and so they have to go answer to the Oyarsa, or the archangel who rules the planet, and uh, Weston makes a total fool out of himself. He's a scientist, and he assumes these are very primitive people. So he gives this eloquent speech about the right of humanity to uh, uh, conquer other species in the name of evolving humanity. And his uh, speech is very eloquent and abstract, but it makes no sense whatsoever when you, uh, when you translate it into concrete terms. So the Oyarsa decides to send them back to Earth. And so uh, they leave the planet, go back to Earth, the plane crashes. He escapes from the crash site. He walks into a pub and says, a pint of bitter, please. So an adventure ends with him back on Earth, going to a pub and getting a pint of bitter as, as a payment for his adventures. That was a fantastic summary. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. Um, and so we'll, we'll uh, uh, dive into some of the different uh, parts of that. 
uh, you know, a little bit later on. Uh, how, well, how would you describe the the genre of Out of the Silent Planet? Well, Lewis liked science fiction and fantasy. He liked Jules Verne. He liked H.G. Wells. Uh, usually there's a distinction in uh, imaginative literature between, or speculative literature, they often call it, between science fiction, which is more plausible. You have to explain how they got the rocket off of Earth. You have to explain how you traveled a, a, a thousand light years to some other galaxy. Whereas fantasy, uh, the, the marvelous just happens through magic or enchantment. On the very first line of In a Hole in the Ground, there lived a hobbit. Tolkien never tries to explain where hobbits came from or how they evolved or if they were an offshoot of some other species. So Lewis liked science fiction and fantasy. He loved George MacDonald, but he also liked H.G. Wells. This first novel, he makes the most effort to uh, write a science fiction novel. When he asks how the spaceship works, which is carrying them off to Mars, uh, Weston says, we're using some of the less observed properties of solar radiation, which is kind of a lame uh, explanation. By the time he got to Paralandra, he decided to dispense with plausibility and just have an angel carry ransom to the planet uh, Paralandra. Lewis liked H.G. Wells in terms of his adventure stories and his plots, but he didn't like his uh, philosophy of life. Wells was one of these who believed that humans should take hold of their own evolution and through eugenics and what we would now call gene splicing, um, that humans would become a kind of a divinity, a species of divinity. And Lewis thought that was very diabolical. So basically in this story, in the H.G. Wells story, From the Earth to the Moon, literally uh, a man is carried off by a scientist and a businessman to the moon and they muck things up and they have to go to the governor of the moon and explain what they're doing. Uh, and that one, I think one of them is killed, but they eventually make it back to Earth. So Lewis kind of took a plot structure from H.G. Wells, but thematically he turned Wells upside down. He said that evolution, evolutionism could actually be called Wellsianity because it was almost a religion of worshiping man in his evolving state. It's, it's interesting how current this story is. When I turn on Netflix or go to theaters, there are so many uh, movies about how we ruined Earth and we have to go to another planet and start over again. We have to colonize mm -hmm. somewhere else. There's at least four or five uh, big adventure stories right now that assume that somehow or other humans are going to destroy Earth and have to move elsewhere. So this whole storyline from back in 1938 is still extremely current. People have a lot of anxiety about uh, our destroying the habitability of our Earth. I have news for them. It'd be a lot easier to fix Earth than it would be to fly thousands of light years somewhere else and start over on a, on a barren planet. But in any case, that was what that was what he was trying to answer in this story was the idea that humans, it's almost the oldest temptation of Genesis, you should become as gods. We mm -hmm. need to figure out how to make ourselves into gods. So the, the newest theory is actually the oldest temptation of humans. Yeah, and I'm thinking also of uh, the popularity of transhumanism. Right. Uh, you know, that uh, progress is going to take us to the point where we live thousands of years and you know, are, are able to cure all disease. I mean, even even today, um, that's a popular in some circles, you know. Um, one of the things uh, that interested me when I actually, uh, when I started reading Lewis, but um, I found it in your book, The Most Reluctant Con Convert, was uh, the relationship between reason and imagination. So many people probably that are listening tonight, they may have read Lewis's apologetics, you know, um, uh, but this book is really, you know, and some of his others, the Chronicles of Narnia and such are more the imagination. So talk just for a minute about the, that relationship between reason and imagination. Well, in his memoir, Surprised by Joy, uh, Lewis said that growing up after he lost his faith, uh, as his childhood faith, he said that the two hemispheres of his brain were completely split apart. He said, everything I loved, I loved fantasy, I loved myth, I loved legend, I loved uh, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, legends of King Arthur. But he said, everything that I loved was imaginary and unreal. And what I thought was real was grim and meaningless, that we're on this barren planet. We seem to be the only life in the universe. There's no benign creator uh, controlling history or looking out for us. So he felt that his uh, intellect and his imagination were split apart. And it wasn't until he met Tolkien 
that uh, he, he was fascinated by the dying God myths. An anthropologist named James Fraser had said that all cultures have a dying God myth, that something is wrong with society and either the king or the God has to be sacrificed in order to put things right. Um, and there's Balder in Norse mythology, there's Osiris in Egyptian mythology. And Fraser said, well, Jesus Christ being crucified, that's just one more dying God myth. And Lewis agreed with Fraser for most of his teens and 20s. When he met uh, Tolkien and another Christian named Hugo Dyson, they said, well, let's reframe that for you. Perhaps what were mythological stories in uh, the Nordic world or the, Medi uh, the uh, Mediterranean world actually became history. Uh, we don't know where Baldur is buried. Nobody looks for where Osiris's tomb might have been. But Jesus was a historical figure. We know where he lived. We know who was the Caesar. We know who was the governor of Judea and Palestine. And so they said this was the moment in history in which myth became fact, in which history and mythology mixed. And the incarnation was a turning point in all of human history. And for the rest of his career, Lewis loved to mix history and mythology, the natural and the supernatural. He didn't want you to be so comfortable with these lines of demarcation. This is the intellect, this is the imagination, this is history, this is mythology, this is the natural, this is the supernatural. And so he uses fiction partly to undermine our security that we know exactly where to draw the line between history and mythology. Mm -hmm. That uh, that was something that struck me, uh, you know, about reading and listening to this was the strangeness of some of it, you know, mm -hmm. the description of uh, some of the creatures and such. Right. And it, um, so is that what he was trying to do with uh, some of that into space and strangeness and all that was, that there, uh, he was accentuating the supernatural side of reality, or what was that about? Well, he's trying. He wrote in a letter how how few reviewers understood that the worldview behind the novel is actually a Christian worldview that we have a creator of the universe, including the solar system, but our planet is being ruled by a rebel angel, and he fell and uh, took humans with him. So we're living behind enemy lines. Uh, one of the great paradigm shifts of the story, it's called Out of the Silent Planet. And when you look at that title, you think, oh, there must be some planet beyond Pluto that we haven't discovered, we haven't heard from, we know nothing about it. And then you get halfway through the story, and it turns out the silent planet is Earth. Uh, the other planets are still in right relationship to Meleldil, the creator, but Earth is, is rebel territory. It's like being behind enemy lines in France during World War II. The people that live there are kind of a, an underground. So he even calls it Thulcandra. Uh, on ancient maps, uh, Ultima Thule was so far north, we didn't know what was going on there. Ultima Thule was, it's so cold and so dark that we have no idea what's happening that far. And so when he calls it Thulcandra, it's kind of the Thule planet. It's the place that's so far out of touch. And as a matter of fact, the Archangel of Malacandra of Mars is very eager to talk to Ransom and find out what's going on on Earth, because none of the other planets know what's going on. And Ransom has the great privilege of telling him about the incarnation, that the, uh, the uh, Meleldil has taken strange counsel and dared great things to try to redeem this lost planet, this silent planet. The, the Archangel says, oh, these are things into which we long to look which reminds you that he's actually a kind of angel. That's exactly what in First Peter it says, we know things into which angels long to look. Lewis loves to do that. He loves to drop in these little hints that his fictional reality, you may not believe in the literal truth of Malacandra and Thulcandra, but actually there's a theological truth underlying the fantasy story. It's a very similar strategy to the Narnia Chronicles, mm -hmm. uh, where the story itself, of course, you don't believe, but the underlying theology is quite sound and it's something that Lewis believed with all his heart. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, is so insightful about Lewis is how he will, uh, you know, even characters um, in his stories will, will be representing some particular philosophy or perspective. Right. Right. So like in this case with uh, Weston and um, how do you, Divine? You, Divine, yeah, I think yeah, Divine. Yeah, I've heard it pronounced different ways. Uh, Weston and Divine, um, they kind of represent two different uh, perspectives or, or um, world worldviews or whatever. So how would you compare those two um, characters? 
Uh, well, they're, even though they're uh, allies on this particular mission, they're very different sort of characters. I have a friend whose last name is Divine, and he spells it the same way as this character. He doesn't mm -hmm. appreciate Lewis uh, creating this villain with his, his the same last name. I wouldn't want to read a novel in which a mass murderer is named Downing, you know, or yeah, uh, yeah. so too bad for him. Uh, mm -hmm. Divine and uh, Weston, even though they're together on this mission, Weston is a visionary, kind of a cracked brain visionary. who really thinks we need to go to Mars. We need to conquer the inhabitants. We need to use that as a base to take over the universe or to continue our evolution. Uh, so he's, earnest in his convictions, even though they're rather ruthless and disturbing convictions. Uh, some people think he's based upon J.B.S. Haldane, this uh, Cambridge professor who actually criticized Lewis. He wrote a famous essay criticizing the Ransom Trilogy, and well should he, because uh, one of the main characters is probably based upon him. Uh, Divine is more of a uh, just practical businessman. He's an entrepreneur, and he says, well, there's an industrial side to all this. And I don't really care what uh, Weston is up to. I'm interested. Basically, he's looking for profit. He wants to make this a colony. It's somewhat similar to uh, meeting the witch Jadis and Uncle Andrew when they first go to Narnia. Jadis actually senses some kind of spiritual warfare that she and Aslan can't coexist. One must, She's the one who throws the lamppost at Aslan and it bounces off his head. Whereas uh, Uncle Andrew, he's thinking, wow, I could make a lot of money out of this. I could uh, bring scrap metal and it would grow up and become machines. So there's rather similar in that one is a real visionary engaged in a kind of spiritual warfare. And the other is kind of a pedestrian entrepreneur just trying to figure out how to make money out of this situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are both naturalists, correct? Right, I mean, right. Yeah. They don't believe in any spiritual realities. Uh -huh. And so in some sense, that you lose moral restraint if you feel there's no high there's no higher power. When uh, Tolkien, I mean, excuse me, when Ransom is talking to the Malachandrians about how things have gone so badly on Earth with war and industrialism, disease and poverty, uh, one of them says, "Well, obviously they're not following Oyarsa. They have no higher power governing them." And the other one says, "Each one wants to be his own Oyarsa, meaning mm -hmm. they all want to govern themselves." Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that verse in Judges where it says. Uh, everyone followed their own judgment. Everybody went their own mm -hmm. way. So Lewis is actually suggesting a kind of great chain of being that you see in the, the uh, Middle Ages. In the great chain of being, uh, humans rule over animals, uh, angels rule over humans, and then God rules over angels. And he's, we're getting a little bit of that in the Out of the Silent Planet. Oh, Yarsa, excuse me, Meleldil is the God figure who made everything. There's Meleldil the Younger, who's the one who's going to Earth to try to fix things from its its uh, broken relationship with the rest of the cosmos. And then the Oyars is a kind of uh, archangel. And then they have Eldils, which are ordinary angels, and then uh, humans and beasts. Uh, two concepts. What's what's Part of what's interesting is the way he portrays angels. Because clearly he said in a letter to children, they're meant to be angels. But they don't have harps and halos. They don't show up and say, fear not. Uh, they're almost invisible. And that's one of the things that fascinated me when I first read the Out of the Silent Planet, the Ransom Trilogy, is he wants his angels to be very subtle. He calls them footsteps of light or a certain uh, uh, dance of sunlight on the, on the lake water. And they're always on the margins of perception. The uh, creatures of Malacandra can see them, but Ransom can't see them very well. And I think I understood this strategy. I told you I first read uh, these books in college. I was reading uh, Out of the Silent Planet in the library, and then I had to walk back to the dormitory in moonlight. And the moonlight was filtering through the trees. And I had this vivid sense of all these footsteps of life, all, uh, of light all around me. And I almost had this sense that right on the margins of my own perception, there might be spiritual realities. So once again, I think Lewis wants to, uh, he called it, smuggling theology into people's minds, making them think, well, perhaps there is a supernatural realm. Perhaps I just saw an, an angel uh, on, out of the corner of my eye. So I loved the way he rehabilitated uh, medieval theology or biblical theology, but he does it in an imaginative way that uh, sneaks past your, your, uh, your intellect, saying, oh, I don't believe in angels. I don't believe in supernatural realities. He wants to stimulate your imagination, and then hopefully that'll open the way for 
more intellectual inquiry. Yeah, Weston uh, reminds me of um, a book uh, that I read one time uh, by Paul Johnson called The Intellectuals. Oh, right, right. And, you know, where he, he just talks about a number of uh, people from Marx to, um, uh, I was trying to remember some of the, but he ends, he ends in up, there. yeah. Yeah, he ends up by saying um, that uh, intellectuals uh, loved humanity. They just couldn't stand people. Right, right. So they're they're willing to sacrifice uh, people for the good of humanity. Right. I remember a chapter on Rousseau who believed that human nature is basically good, and that children uh, they're spoiled by uh, school and parenting and society. But in real life, he gave away his children. He had several children, which he didn't raise himself, so he could afford to abstractly believe in the goodness of children because he never actually set out to the hard work of actually raising his own children. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting book. It's amazing how often people have an attractive philosophy and they write well, but if you look at their own lives, it's a real shipwreck. They don't, they don't walk their talk, as uh, Johnson didn't say, because he was more eloquent than that. Yeah, no, another, another example of that in the book was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who right. you know, went about um, having kids all over, you know, wherever he happened to end up. Right. And then abandoning them to move on to the next. Right. Area one, of the, uh, one of the characteristics of Lewis's villains is that they always like abstraction over uh, concrete reality. And we'll rather talk about the working classes than to go out and see what it's like to be somebody who puts in 12 hours a day, an individual. In the last one, we're going to read that that hideous strength, uh, Mark Studdick is actually a sociologist, and he has a lot of abstract information and statistics about the working classes. But when he actually sees these people in a small village, he's kind of surprised. They're kind of pathetic, but they're also uh, endearing, and one of them reminds him of his aunt. And he's never really thought of them as actual people. So the villains in Lewis's stories, this is also true of Narnia, they tend to love abstraction over concreteness. Uh, they have no regard for the sanctity of human life or animal life. And uh, they often uh, use a lot of hellish language. They say, what the hell, or you be damned, or what's, what's the infernal racket about? They just, their very language suggests that they're on the wrong side of, of the spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. uh, one person is asking, uh, it's a good question, um, uh, how... Uh, Oyarsa, when you, Oyarsa said that uh, he'd take Weston over Divine because Weston uh, was uh, broken, but Divine is only bent. So right. what, what's going on there? Well, um, he introduces this interesting concept in this novel called Hanau, which is H-N-A-U. Lewis said uh, the uh, Malachandrians tend to, tend to put an H in front of their words. Uh, it's probably based on the, the Wynnums in uh, uh, Gulliver's Travels. The, the Harasa are actually, that means horse in Old Norse. But the idea of Hanau is that you're a rational soul. You have reasoning ability and you also have uh, moral ch choices and a moral nature. In one place, uh, Ransom says, well, they're only half Hanau. They, they have reasoning ability, but they've lost their moral bearings. They've lost their moral compass. I think the reason he says that... Uh, Weston is bent is because he still has this philosophy. He's, he has one moral principle, which is the good of humanity. So he's not totally self-centered and he's willing to make sacrifices and risk his life because he thinks that somehow uh, Lewis in the, the ab abolition of man says there's this great tapestry of moral principles that are all interwoven and you can't pull out one strand such as love of kindred or love of country and make that your total morality because you'll end up making terribly unethical decisions based on the other strands. So Weston is someone who believes in uh, humanity. So he does have one positive moral value, whereas divine is just utterly selfish. All he wants to do is get ahead, mm -hmm. regardless of what that costs other people. So I believe that he thinks, even though he's a friendlier person, uh, he's, that's actually more despicable than somebody who's trying to do things for the good of humanity. So, so would you say divine is a is a total pragmatist, and um, has no absolutes or whatever? It's just right. Yeah, he does, and it's it's a very selfish pragmatism. 
at one point when Weston is talking about how to get along with the the uh, inhabitants of Malacandra, uh, Divine says, I don't care if you kill them or experiment on them or sleep with them, whatever you do, it doesn't matter to me. He, he just wants mm -hmm. to know what the bottom line is. And there's kind of an utter moral bankruptcy there, which is even more disturbing than what we see in Weston. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's a thing that kind of runs through here that, that, that um, got me as I, uh, as I listened to it, and it was uh, fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and dealing with fear. And I read uh, in the uh, in your book, uh, the Ransom Trilogy reveals an author grappling with the child inside of him and retracing some of the key steps in his own spiritual pilgrimage. Right. And so explain that and, and how fear plays into the storyline. Well, Lewis himself was beset with anxieties. His mother died when he was only nine years old. And his father sent him off to boarding school in England. And uh, not only was it a totally foreign environment, it was a very bad boarding school. Uh, the headmaster would uh, beat the boys and swear at them and just give them the same assignments over and over. And Lewis said he remembered lying awake at night in this curtainless dormitory at this boarding school and just worrying about his life, worrying about his future, worrying about his safety. And it's interesting how often he mentions the moon five times in Surprised by Joy. And it's interesting how often the moon comes up as a symbol in Lewis's fiction. In this story, when he first uh, is captured and taken off in the spaceship, he looks out the uh, window and sees this megalomaniac disc, which he thinks is a huge full moon. And slowly he realizes that they are off the planet. And he's actually looking back at Earth. Uh, he had nightmares his whole life, uh, and he struggled with... Uh, anxieties about his career, anxieties about his domestic situation. He had a very difficult home life with his adopted mother, Mrs. Moore. Uh, we'll see that again when we get to Paralandra. In the opening scene, it's Lewis speaking as if he were a character in the novel, but he's having a terrible anxiety attack. Uh, part of what Lewis did in his fiction was emotional healing. He often tried to fix things in an imaginative world that couldn't be fixed in real life. In The Magician's Nephew, the little boy's mother is dying of cancer and there's nothing he can do about it. And the reason he decides to go to other worlds is he thinks there might be a cure for cancer somewhere else. Uh, in this novel, uh, the day that Lewis's mother died in August of 1910, when he was nine years old, uh, they had a Shakespeare calendar in the house. And the quote for that day said, men must endure, endure their going hence, ripeness is all, which is a line from King Lear. And at the funeral ceremony, when one of the uh, Harasa is killed, they have a ceremony of, of uh, letting the body dissolve. And their chant is, uh, let it go hence, let it go hence, let it be no body. And it's fascinating to me that in that funeral dirge, we're actually hearing an echo of the Shakespearean quote that Lewis remembered from the day his mother died. And in many ways, death on Malacandra is a much more peaceful affair than it is on Earth. They know they're going to go to, to Oyarsa. Uh, one of the Harasa says, uh, the, the, this something was the best day of my life. I had an encounter with Meleldil. He said it was the best day of my life until I drink of death and go to be with Meleldil. And it's almost a strange way of saying, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. So the Malachandrians, at first he thinks are very primitive, but it turns out they're very spiritually mature and very balanced. They don't have wars, they don't have crime, they don't fear death, and they understand what it is to be in right relationship with God. So uh, I think Lewis, that comes up in all of his fiction, you have these fearful characters learning to overcome anxiety and to live by trust. That happens in Narnia as well as the Ransom Trilogy. Yeah, I thought uh, this was an interesting uh, paragraph in your book on page 102. Lewis was an, uh, at Oxford when he wrote Out of the Silent Planet, not Cambridge. And his specialty was literature, not language, though he could certainly qualify as a philologist given his knowledge of, and this is what got me, given his knowledge of classical Greek, Latin, Anglo-Saxon, medieval English, French, Latin, Icelandic, and modern French, German, and Italian. That's correct. That's correct. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking, man, that's that's like two more languages than I know. 
Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Just I was going to say. I was going to no, say. I mean, that's amazing there. But uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, he learned a lot of those as a teenager. Uh, he learned Greek and Latin in uh, boarding school, and his mother taught him French. And then he wanted to read German poetry, so he worked on German. And finally, he got enamored of Dante. He's not a Christian. He's a teenager, but he knows how important Dante is. And he learns medieval Italian just so he can read Dante in the original. So, uh, yeah, he was. it's a little discouraging for those of us who are still trying to finish our exams in uh, yeah. Spanish or French to find out that he... Uh, Tolkien, you could even add more to the list. Tolkien knew all of those and then add in Welsh and Celtic and Finnish. Of course, Tolkien and, was a philologist, so he did that. the ones he made up. <laughs> yeah, and the ones he made up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? Neither one of them knew Southern. <laughs> oh, is that right? That's right. Uh, okay. So we have uh, somebody ask about uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And, right. uh, you know, what, what's like... Um, how does this story relate to like, uh, you know, what uh, Bunyan was doing with Pilgrim's Progress? Well, uh, Lewis loved Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote an essay on it called The Vision of John Bunyan. And uh, he also wrote an update called The Pilgrim's Regress. When he first became a Christian, he was so excited about his newfound faith that he wrote the story in two weeks called The Pilgrim's Regress. And he updates the story of Christian going to the, uh, the Mount Zion, which is heaven, and for in Pilgrim's Regress, he's trying to feet, reach this beautiful island that he saw, this vision of paradise, and eventually realizes that it's not a place, it's a person. He's been trying to find God. Um, but I think on the very first page, Ransom is called the pedestrian. He's on a walking tour, so he's on foot, but it's capitalized three times. And I think this is uh, Lewis's homage to Pilgrim's Progress. He's saying we're all on a spiritual journey and uh, Ransom, even a big problem in Pilgrim's Progress, he's got this heavy backpack, which is conviction of sin. And he, he's being crushed by this burden until he gets to the foot of the cross. And then the, the, uh, the burden rolls away, the backpack leaves. And it's interesting that uh, Lewis is very worried about his back, excuse me, Ransom, the character, is worried about his backpack. He throws it over the hedge and then he has to retrieve it. When he tries to escape, he opens the door. He's been drugged and they're gonna take him to Mars. And he opens the door and for one second he sees his backpack on the porch and then he gets dragged back into the house. So I think he definitely is having fun with saying that Ransom is a new pilgrim on a new spiritual journey. And he literally through the three stories, he will grow in uh, spiritual wisdom and maturity and spiritual serenity. By that he has strength, he's in the upper room with a wounded foot and people just come meet him and overwhelmed by his, his spiritual radiance. But in some ways, he's arrived spiritually. He's almost a mystic by the time he's done with these adventures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, mysticism, I, I just want to mention one of your other books. Uh, um, and the title, remind me. Uh, Into the Region of Awe. And, and, uh, and you... Um, you go into Lewis and answering the question of was Lewis a mystic and what is mysticism right. and that kind of very interesting. Yeah, there's actually a couple of scenes in this book when he's talking to Hoyoy, the uh, Harasa. He says, one day I, I climbed up to the holy mountain where you can see the stars at midday and I had an encounter with Meleldil and that was the most important day of my life. Ever since then, my song has been richer and my... Uh, my voice has been deeper and my life has been calmer. And he says, I'll never reach that again. And I, I said earlier, until I drink of death and go to be with Mel Eldil. So there's even a paragraph describing a mystical experience by one of the Malachandrians. That'll get picked up again in Paralandra. And then there are even some mystical moments in the Narnia Chronicles. Uh -huh. uh, I discovered in his letters that he quoted or referred to over 40 Christian mystics. Uh, all the way from Augustine to Simone Weil, the 20th century mystic. And he was fascinated by people who felt they had a uh, experience of being in the presence of God, apart from just intellectual understanding of theology or imaginative embrace of a Christian worldview. They had some kind of a personal experience that was very important to them. He didn't claim to be a mystic, but he always felt it was very spiritually enriching, enriching to uh, read the mystics. Uh-huh. Um 
So we have a question here. Uh, is there an intended contrast we're to draw between uh, the planets of uh, Malacandra and Paralandra? Uh, on the one hand, they appear quite similar, but on the other, they uh, appear quite different. Right. Uh, well, Lewis said that uh, God never lets the same thing happen twice. And so if you look at the uh, Malacandra and Paralandra and then that his strength takes place back on Earth, Malacandra is the oldest planet and it's dominated by red. And the reason there are these great canals or channels is because there was a great war with the uh, fallen Oyarsa, the fallen archangel of Earth, Lucifer, or Satan. Uh, Earth is kind of in the middle of its history. We're in the midst of this warfare between good and evil, which we'll see in that hideous strength. Paralandra is a brand new world. It's still paradise there. He, in this book, he spelled it P-A-R, but then he changed it to P-E-R for the title of the second story. But I think he was thinking of it's the paradise planet. It's the unfallen Eden. Um, it's an interesting parallel between the different worlds in Narnia, because Charn is an old dead world, which is dominated by red colors. And then they come back to Earth, to London. And then they go to Narnia, which is a brand new world, which hasn't fallen yet. And it's uh, dominated by the color green. So he had in his mind this idea that there's this great unfolding of different worlds or different planets, and they're all at different stages of their evolution, their spiritual evolution. Um, so what uh, what would you say uh, is the connection between Weston and divine? Uh, sorry, um, I just slipped. Um, and Lewis's idea of the materialist magician. Uh, yeah, that's, well, Weston, I would say Weston is a dreamer and Divine is a schemer. And we're going to meet Weston again in Paralandra, and we're going to meet Divine again in that hideous strength. Uh, the materialist magician, I think, used, Lewis used the word magician to mean someone who dabbles in the occult, someone who tries to gain power through uh, harnessing uh, unseen forces. It doesn't mean sleight of hand. The magician's nephew, he literally is is uh, trying to gain power. Uh, Lewis has a fascinating parallel between science and magic. He says they both thrived in the Renaissance. People think that magic is from the Middle Ages, but he says there's very little magic in the Middle Ages. It's really the Renaissance. And they're both attempts to get reality to yield to your will. He says they're actually twins, but magic died out because it didn't work. Uh, you couldn't wave a wand and turn uh, a base metal into gold. Alchemy, uh, yeah. Write, yeah. Write um, so I think a uh, materialist magician is someone who doesn't want to believe in ultimate spiritual realities or definitely not to yield their, their spirit to God, but they still want to use uh, mis uh, understood forces to gain power over reality. Lewis said the old wisdom was to conform your will to reality through discipline and, and knowledge. And the new, uh, wisdom is to try to get reality to conform itself to your will. So I think the materialist magician is someone who's not oriented toward God or spiritual things as such, but they think there may be occult forces they can use to their to their uh, gain. Okay. Um, in terms of the space trilogy, uh, the question is: uh, uh, Jesus was God in the flesh, at least for our solar system. Did Lewis ever give his personal view of life? beyond our solar system and new incarnations of the Logos? Uh, well, he wrote a fascinating essay called Religion and Rocketry. Uh, when the space programs were starting in the 50s and 60s, people said, well, what if we get to another world and they have different gods or different history and suddenly where's Christianity going to fit into that? And uh, Lewis said, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. First of all, we have to discover if there is life on other worlds. Secondly, is if there is life, is it intelligent? Is it is it uh, if it's lichens and and uh, mushrooms and single celled organisms? We're not really going to talk about theology or a fall. So he said, basically, he's using his idea of the the hanal. Are they rational spirits? Do they make moral choices? And thirdly, are they fallen? Uh, and if they are fallen and need to be redeemed. What, what, how would God handle that in a different world? Uh, he answered that question in the Narnia Chronicles. What if God were a lion? He calls them supposals. So Lewis said that uh, some people say, oh, there's no life in the universe. It's just us. 
were just a fluke and that proves there is no God. And other people say, well, there's probably lots of life in the universe. We're probably just one form of life. And other creatures probably have their own theology and their own worldview and their own ethical beliefs. And Lewis said, God is kind of like the defendant who no matter what you say, it will be used against you. So people <laughs> argue that if there is no life, that proves there's no God. But if there's other forms of life, that also proves there's no God. So he wanted to take a step back. Uh, I love how Lewis, the intellectual in its expository prose, would often tackle the same questions he did in his fiction. So if yeah. you read religion and ro rocketry, you can't help but think of Malacandra and these Hanau species and uh, how they're still in right relationship with the creator. So I would recommend to that reader, they go have a look at religion and rocketry. He actually, he didn't want the earth, uh, he didn't want earthlings to uh, explore space because he thought since we're fallen, we're gonna take our fallenness with us. <laughs> and uh, he was actually unhappy when he heard that the, uh, uh, that the Americans were planning to land a spacecraft on the moon. He said, oh, those blackguards are going to spoil the moon. He thought that outer space was kind of a quarantine so that we couldn't travel to other worlds and take all of our problems with us. So we messed this one up. What makes us think we do any better? And Yeah. Uh, another a lot of these yeah. science fiction stories, they seem to think that if we had a new start on a new planet, we'd do it right this time. But I see no evidence of that. Uh, you know, exploring new worlds certainly didn't fix Europe and uh, other exploration. So I'm sure that if we take ourselves to new planet, we're probably going to create all the same problems yeah. we've created here on Earth. It'd be kind of like, uh, you know, fix the problems in your own city before you go out. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so, uh, Joel Heck, I wonder if this is, uh, I read a book by Joel Heck on uh, C.S. Lewis. I wonder if this is the same person. Yeah, probably uh, going from atheism to Christianity. Or... Yeah. Boy, excellent book. Excellent right, book. right. Um, can you comment on the fact that Ransom sees the earth from Malacandra, but upside down? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Joel Heck, I was just looking. He's got a wonderful website called Chronologically Lewis, and you can look up what Lewis was doing virtually every day of his life for which there's a record. Somebody asked me today if he ever met Michael Polanyi, the scientist. And so I went to Joel's website and I typed in Michael Polanyi, and sure enough, he spoke at the Socratic Club, this club that Lewis started in Oxford. Really? So thank you, Joel, for your assistance on reference questions. Yeah. Um, the, there's a scene in that H.G. Wells novel I mentioned, From the Earth to the Moon, where he looks back on Earth and he realizes how everything seems so big and important to us. It's just this little blue marble in space. Uh, Wells conceived of this before he'd even, obviously, we had uh, pictures of, the, of Earth from outer space. And the character says it was the bleakest moment of all of his life because Earth seems so small and unimportant when viewed from outer space. And I think Lewis is playing a little bit with the same idea that you have to get outside of Earth to see what it's actually like. Uh, at the end of the story, he sees uh, the Fiffeltrigi are artists and they do pictures of Harasa and pictures of the you Oyarsa know, as a winged flame. And there's little stumpy creatures who go around uh, and he can't figure out what the stumpy creatures are supposed to represent. And then he figures out that they're supposed to represent humans. Alecandra has a very uh, small gravitational field. So all the creatures tend to be very tall and spindly and elegant. And so they don't know what to make of these short, stumpy creatures who show up. And I think part of that looking back on Earth is to kind of get a perspective on ourselves by seeing ourselves from the outside. Mm -hmm. First time Crystal and I went to England, we went to very obscure places where there were no American tourists up in Scotland. And for two or three days, we didn't hear any American voices. And then we were taking the train back to Edinburgh and there were some Americans on the train and their voices sounded so gravelly and flat and nasal. And we suddenly realized what Americans sound like to, you know, English people. And I had a little bit of that feeling of uh, ransom seeing humans as these stumpy little creatures in the eyes of the Martians. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have to ask you this question. Uh, um, what's up with uh, Weston making such a fool of himself uh, before in front of the uh, Oyarsa, you know, with this uh, talking uh, right. st staccato that he, that he does, you know? That, right. Well, this is a classic example. On Wikipedia, they actually have the speech and they have its translation. Somebody thought it was so amusing 
Uh, Weston is this visionary who's quite sure that they have the moral right to extinguish other species or people of other planets for the sake of humanity. So he says, we have the industry, we have the technology, we have all these marvels of science. We need to move forward in our evolution. Therefore, we need to destroy lesser species that stand in our way. And it all sounds very grandiloquent when you put it in that abstract terms, but then Ransom has to translate it for the Oyarsa because they don't understand English. And he says, we can take heavy things and throw them far. Therefore, we have a right to kill you. And it's, it's a great parody of how these great abstractions sound ridiculous when you break them down into uh, concrete terms. He used to write to people who gave him advice about writing. He always said, think concretely and write concretely. Don't say mortality rose, say more people died. And so that whole parody is uh, a, uh, a fun way of exposing excessive abstraction and not realizing that you're talking about killing people. You're not talking about uh, exterminating lesser species. It's the same thing happens with uh, right to life issues, especially euthanasia. When Lewis was writing this in the 30s, there was a, uh, a big movement about getting rid of the unfit and so that humanity could progress, more or less improving the gene pool. But what that means in reality is killing the unfit. That means exterminating people that don't fit your definition. And for the Germans, that meant Jews and gypsies and uh, gay people. So it's one thing to talk about improving the gene pool. And it's quite another thing to actually talk about starting to murder those who don't fit your uh, definition of what's a good human being. Mm -hmm. So I think that's mainly a really, uh, it's fun to read in class, have someone read what uh, Weston says, and then have someone else read mm -hmm. translation. At one point, Weston says, she meaning life has to move forward, the life force has to evolve. And uh, Ransom says, well, excuse me, who is she again? Well, life, of course, you idiot. Uh, it's gotten so abstract that now the life force is mm -hmm. taking on a gender and identity. Yeah, that's one of my favorite passages in the whole book. Well, um, Kelly asks, uh, Ransom's volunteering to face a probable death to go back to Earth to possibly save or open the silent planet. Sounds familiar, huh? And then uh, why is it he also, uh, why is he also a sort of ransom for Harry in the beginning? So I guess uh, just connecting the the ransom willingness to be, the, you know, the ransom. Right, in, right. Yeah, both cases. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. And that'll get even more uh, clear when we read Paralandra. Uh, the origin, originally, the character's name was, was Unwin, which means anxiety or angst in uh, Old German. So the character's name was going to be Unwin. But when Lewis submitted it to a publisher, one of the most promising was named Unwin and Allen. And Lewis was afraid that they would think he was flattering them by naming his character after their publisher. So he changed the name to Ransom. Uh, it is interesting that... Uh, the reason he gets into this whole adventure is because he's looking after this uh, mentally challenged boy named Harry. There's, there may be a joke there. The character of Divine may be based upon a uh, uh, very kind of flippant uh, colleague of Lewis's at Oxford named uh, T.D. Weldon, and his name, he went by Harry. So here we are taking one of our, uh, a skeptic, what Lewis called him a hard-boiled atheist. So you're taking this character you don't like and you're naming a uh, mentally challenged boy in the novel after Harry Weldon. So there may be an inside <laughs> joke there. But he does. Uh, the whole reason he gets into the adventure is he feels an obligation to the mother to help this boy. And then when he sees that the boy is being dragged somewhere he doesn't want to go, he intervenes. Uh, it's interesting. The same thing happens in uh, The Magician's Nephew, where he has to go find out what happened to Polly. He feels uh, uh, obligated to... So it's an act of compassion that leads them into these great spiritual adventures. And of course, the, the, the spiritual adventures do them great good. They end up being uh, much better people than they might have been otherwise. But you are correct. His name fits perfectly in that he is acting as a ransom for the little boy. In uh, Paralander, it's going to be even more explicit. He's going to talk to a voice who says, my name is also ransom. So every Christian in some way is a little Christ. We have to be willing to uh, be a ransom for the salvation of others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, good point. So um uh what what was the uh Mal uh, Malachandran's uh, view of death? 
How would you describe that? Well, they have uh, an interesting discussion about death and they see um, time differently than we do. Ransom talks about having uh, falling in love is so exciting and then you have the memory, of, the memory of falling in love and that's kind of anticlimactic. And the Malachandrians say, no, it's all one thing. Falling in love and growing in love and the memory of early love, that's all one cycle. You shouldn't try to separate the two. And they feel the same way about death. Uh, since they are in direct touch with Meleldil and the Oyarsa, they don't have a fear of death that humans do. And so this funeral service is actually a beautiful service. Uh, they're singing together uh, about the body disappearing. Lewis, when his mother died, he had to go view the his mother in a casket. And he said, the ugliest person alive is a thing of beauty compared to a dead body. He had this extremely traumatic experience of seeing his mother's dead body. And it's interesting, uh, when the when the corpse disappears in Malachandria, uh, Divine says, oh, that solves the problem of the body. And you're trying to be uh, uh, sarcastic and, and whimsical. But in a way, it did solve the problem of the body for Lewis. If you saw, if you really saw that death is just a continuation of life, we're going to be with Mel Eldil, we're going to be with Christ. You don't have the same fear of it that you do if you uh, uh, think that that's the extinction of your consciousness. Um, yeah. Uh, one uh, one person said. Um, or uh, posted this. He said, I found it interesting when Lewis including, uh, includes the following as a summary of human history, war, slavery, and prostitution. Right. Right. Uh, that's not a very <laughs> uh, high view of human history. I guess, uh, I guess he's, uh, he's recognizing the effects of the fall Right, definitely. They're from the silent planet. They're from a fallen planet. He actually throws yeah. in industrialism there, too. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, this novel has a number of paradigm shifts. When he First, he doesn't realize he's looking at Earth. He thinks it's the moon. When he gets to outer space, he'd always thought it was dark and cold and empty. And he mm -hmm. looks out the window, and it's radiant, and it's beautiful, and it's full of light. The medievals believe that the uh, universe was full of ether, which is this substance which is even lighter than air and more beautiful than air. The word empyrean means the realm of fire. So he has a paradigm shift. I think it's interesting since he wrote this novel, we have these wonderful Hubble telescope photographs of nebula and constellations. And there's a kind of light and beauty and color that we never imagined back in the old days when even when I was a kid, I thought of the night sky as just a bunch of white dots on a black field. And you could get a, a view of a few of the planets, but not much else. It's interesting to me how much modern uh, astronomy almost reinforces the idea that there's this beauty and color and radiance in space. So he doesn't want it to call it space anymore. He wants to call it the heavens. That's why I call it the Ransom Trilogy rather than the Space Trilogy. Mm -hmm. uh, another paradigm shift is he thinks they're very primitive because he doesn't see houses and cars and bridges and airplanes. And at one point he says, he thought he may need to engage them in some religious instruction. It's almost like the natives who have to be told about Christianity. But the more he talks to them, there's another paradigm shift. Uh, he's the one who's full of anxiety. He's from a fallen planet. So he's afraid to meet creatures from another planet. First, he's afraid to meet the uh, Harasa. Then he's afraid to meet the Sorns. Then he's afraid to meet Oyarsa. And then he's actually afraid to go back in the, in the rocket back to Earth. And the Oyarsa says, there's, there's nothing too wrong with you except for too many fears. Uh, so I think that's one of those paradigm shifts that he's in a unfallen planet, which is still in rightful relationship to its creator, and it's Earth that needs to be fixed. And when he mentions all this, he's actually kind of embarrassed to tell Earth's history to these people. They have no crime. They have no war. Uh, they have no disease that you can tell about. They do have hanakras. They have these shark-like creatures that inhabit the rivers. But they say even knowing that you could die gives a sweetness to life that might not other be a part of our life. Uh, Lewis did have a pretty low view. Of, part of the reason he liked the medieval worldview is he did like the great chain of being. If you read the discarded image, he lays out all the beauties mm -hmm. of their worldview, even uh, an orderly society. He knew it didn't work in real life, but he liked the idea that you could have a king and then royalty and then gentry and then 
working people. Uh, he said nobody deserves to have that much power over human beings, other human beings, because we're all fallen. But I think in many ways, he and Tolkien both wouldn't have minded go back to the world of the Shire, where you don't have cars, you don't have airplanes. Uh, pretty much turn of the century England, I think, would have been fine for both of them. Yeah, that'd be nice until you got a toothache. <laughs> yeah, <that's true>. Good <laughs> point. Uh, um, so, yeah, he referred to himself as a dinosaur. Right, right. Yeah, this lecture, his inaugural lecture at Cambridge, she said, yeah. you know, I'm still a Christian. Let me introduce you to the world when Christianity was still the, the reigning uh, worldview. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, he did refer to himself, which is kind of ironic because many of the uh, more contemporary writers of his era have been forgotten. And that dinosaur is still thriving here 60 years later. Uh, he said one place, the harder you try to be up to date, the more quickly you will be out of date. So he was wise to go for... Uh, broad truth about the human condition rather than trying to address mm -hmm. a lot of contemporary issues. Yeah. So, uh, so DM says, uh, seems like, uh, Lewis was way ahead of his time by understanding clearly the true nature of, of, uh, narcissism. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's and, true. You know, you know, I, it makes me think of, uh, the screw tape letters where he makes the comment where somebody asked him or somebody said, or, or wrote, uh, the, you know, the person who wrote this must have uh, studied psychology or something. And he right. said, no, I just know myself. Right. Yeah. I just looked into my own heart and, yeah. and found these things. Yeah. Uh, he was very good about that. He says the, the mark of hell is an unblinking concentration on the self. Ironically, uh, Screwtape has gained a lot of ground since that was written in 1942. I think Screwtape would be very happy with the way that modern culture has developed. Many of his strategies seem to have I mean, the whole thing with social media, it's made everybody a lot more narcissistic than they might have been a generation ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you have, of course, um, I'm thinking of in Mere Christianity, the chapter of the great sin. Right. You know, which is pride. So he saw, I guess that that was following Augustine that, you know, pride was the kind of the the root that everything else, you know, kind right. of that seems was. to be the worst of all sins. He calls pride the completely anti-God state of mind. You know, you want to be a rival God. You don't want to surrender to God. In his own life, that was the, the hardest part for him being converted. Uh, he In Screwtape Letters, he describes the human personality as kind of like three concentric circles, like an archery target. And the outer circle was the imagination. The middle circle was the intellect. And the, the target, the inside, was the will. And he felt that most people, in order to change their minds about something, First, you have to engage their imagination, and then you have to convince their intellect that it's plausible. But finally, to be a Christian, you have to surrender your will. In his own life, uh, he, is he said he was, his imagination was baptized by George MacDonald when he was 17. That was only the outer circle of his personality. And then his intellect became convinced by uh, Tolkien and Dyson and others in his late 20s and early 30s that Christianity really was plausible. But the hardest part for him, as he explains in Surprised by Joy, was to surrender his will. He wanted to be the captain of his soul. He didn't want to have a feeling that I need to give up a lot of these selfish impulses and surrender mm -hmm. them to God. So when it came to narcissism, as you say, he didn't have to read a lot of psychology books or moral philosophy. Mm -hmm. He could feel it right inside of his, his own heart. Yeah. And then that uh, phrase that he has the trend, the transcendent or uh, transcendent interferer. So he said, right. you know, God, you know, he he uh, you think you can only just give him a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But he wants it all. So right. he said that's right. that's what scared him the most was that God was going to interfere with his life. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. There's a line he liked from Augustine where he says, uh, uh my soul is so so small and broken down, Lord. Please come and fix it. But you sort of want God to come into your life just to fix this one little corner. Uh, yeah, I have to admit the shed needs repainting. So God, can we do? A, but God suddenly starts pulling down the roof and uh, pulling down the uh, all the basic structure and the foundation, and it's really more than we signed up for. Yeah. So he, he several times he makes that analogy that being a Christian is a lifelong reconstruction project. And it may often be painful because of the, the old Adam wants to hold on to things. And of course, there's no better example of that than in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. 
right is, right Eustace is uh de dedragoned and yeah. Uh, yeah and he wants to use his own self-effort to t he wants to be a little boy again so he rips off the dragon skin there's another dragon skin under that he rips that off there's another one under that it's like a, a russian doll and finally uh Aslan says, well, I, th I think I need to do it. So Aslan takes his claw and cuts to the quick. And it is painful, but then the little boy uh, reemerges. It's interesting that Lewis wrote a letter once about uh, trying to do self-improvement. And he says, you know, I work on this one thing and then another thing comes up and I work on another thing. And finally, when I feel like I'm making progress and I'm really proud of my progress, I realize that I'm proud of my humility. <laughs> so he almost sounded like, Eustace, you know, th that kind of self-effort will only get you so yeah. far. And ultimately, you have to give it over to God to do the, the reconstruction part progress yeah. process. Yeah. And then, and of course, that's in one of the uh, screw tape letters where uh, he's instructing the junior demon. He says, uh, you know, if your your subject is making some progress and remind him of that. Right. And, right. And then, you know, but don't push him too far because he'll just uh, laugh and, and then go to bed. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, when uh, when uh, Filtrig showed Ransom the image he had created, uh, he said it could uh, it could not be too much like him or later generations would not believe it. Is that significant? Too much like Ransom would not be too much like him. Um, let's see the image he had uh, created, he said. It could not be too much like him, or later generations would not believe it. So I oh, guess, it's, yeah. Um, well, yeah. The Fiffeltrig are the artisans and the sculptors of this world. Fiffeltrig in uh, in uh, Old Icelandic means safe monster. He actually got these words. Harasa means horse, uh, and uh, the handramet the, the landscapes mean highlands and lowlands in Old Norse. We're talking about his philological knowledge. Uh, he and Tolkien would get together and go line by line through the Elder Eddas in Old Icelandic. And uh, so he pulled some of these words out of Old uh, Old Norse. Um, I think it's significant. They're all kind of stylizations. When you look at Egyptian cuneiform, they're very stylized men and women and animals. So I think we're getting a little bit of that feeling that this is a stylized portrait of humans. But the main things that strikes Ransom is how short and stumpy they look compared to the world of Malacandra. Mm-hmm. By the way, all this Icelandic and all this, it reminds me of uh, how uh, Jack, and, uh, Lewis, and Joy used to play Scrabble in right. Indian languages. Right. All languages were, were even the Hebrew. They, she would throw in some Hebrew. And uh, Doug Gresham says they, they very seldom challenged each other because they... Uh, they would go into a language the other person didn't know as well, and you weren't confident for a challenge. So he said, <laughs> most of the words that were put on the board stayed on the board. But literally, all those languages you mentioned early, plus Hebrew and New Testament Greek, were a fair game for their Scrabble. Uh, um, well, hey, why, does, uh, why do you think uh, Lewis inserts himself uh, into the story at the end? Well, this is... Uh, Part of his strategy is to blur the lines between reality and or the reality we see and the reality we can't see, we believe in, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And he wants your imagination to not have a clear demarcation between what's real and what's not real. It's like making the Eldils uh, into these footsteps of light rather than these real overwhelming creatures. Uh, so by putting himself into the story, he gives the feeling of, oh, this, this really happened. And there really is a guy named C.J. Webb who wrote Lewis about this unusual word, Oyarsis. And he speculated that it might be a uh, corruption of the word Usiarch, heavenly ruler. And so here's the real C.S. Lewis, who's an Oxford professor. Here's a real world Oyarsa. Uh, here's a real scholar named C.J. Webb who's inquiring. So when he goes to Ransom, Ransom says, well, yeah, I, I have a, quite a story to tell you. You better sit down while I tell you what the story is behind uh, Oyarsa or Usiark. And I think he's trying to erase the boundaries between uh, myth and history, between the natural and the supernatural. As a matter of fact, he got letters saying, I need to speak to your friend Ransom. Uh, something similar happened to me, and I'd love to compare notes. So he actually, some people felt 
that, uh, you know, this must have really happened because of those kind of details. The same thing happens at the beginning of Paralandra. This time he ins inserts himself as a character into the beginning of the story. I got a letter a few weeks ago that said, tell me honestly, do you think the screw tape letters are authentic? And this person seemed to want to know if Lewis had hacked Satan's server and gotten these letters off his server. So I had to explain that they were spiritually authentic and psychologically authentic, but I didn't believe they were actually written by a higher demon to a lower demon. Uh, <laughs> but he likes to do that. He likes to make you wonder where the natural ends and where the supernatural begins. Mm -hmm. uh, Diana Glyer has written a really good book called The Company They Keep about the influence the Inklings had on each other. At the very end of the story, Ransom writes a critique of the story and says, well, you made it sound like there's only one kind of harassa. There's actually a lot of different kinds. And you made it sound like the weather was always the same. And Diana mm -hmm. Glyer thinks, and I rightly so, that a lot of those comments were probably Tolkien's when he read the first manuscript. So the Ransom critiquing the experiences, it, Tolkien was a great world builder. He put much more into it than Lewis did. He has entire invented languages. The landscapes are much more detailed, the weather and the terrain. And uh, so, and there's a scene similar to that in the uh, Lord of the Rings where the uh, riders of Rowan meet Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli. And they say they're looking for hobbits. They're looking for these halflings. And one of the Roar, Roar Rims says, well, that's just children's stories. Are you going to talk about hobbits when you're standing here on the green earth in the light of day? And Aragorn says, well, sometimes myth and legend can coexist even on this green earth in the light of day. So he's making the same point that one, one person thinks is a legend, someone else realizes it's real. So I believe he injected himself into the story to add to realism. He's being very uh, candid, like, oh, well, this, this really happened to a friend of mine named Ransom. But he's also being very crafty. He's making you wonder, did this guy Lewis actually know people who'd been away from this world? Hmm. So it's a very clever effect. I, I like the effect he had. Well, boy, this has been good. Uh, is there is there anything uh, as we're preparing, you know, to uh, now to read and discuss Paralandra coming out of the out of, out of the Silent Planet? Is there anything that you would say to us uh, in preparation for for reading uh, Paralandra? Well, I would say um, that Ransom has pretty much overcome his anxiety. He's very calm about going off to Paralandra. So, one question for me would be. What other spiritual growth needs to happen in Ransom? He's done a good job of overcoming anxieties, but he's still got quite a bit of room for growth spiritually. So I would ask people to think, um, you know, what, what more uh, soul work does Ransom need to engage in in Paralandra? Mm -hmm. I would also ask for to keep in mind, this is a paradisal world which is unfallen, but a new serpent has appeared in this world who's going to try to tempt them the same way that Adam and Eve were tempted. So I would ask readers to compare what is the one thing you can't do on Paralandra. It's not eating from a tree. It's a different kind of prohibition, and there's a different psychology behind it. Uh, in my mind, Eve had it easy compared to Tinadrill, the, the green lady of Paralandra. It's a much subtler temptation than just ye shall be as gods. So that's two questions I would ask them to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, I would also say that there's a great confrontation and a physical battle at the end, but then there's a lot of material after the battle. And so I would ask, why does the story keep going on after the, the, uh, the main enemy has been destroyed? Why doesn't the novel get wrapped up? Why does it continue for almost a quarter of the novel? So look at that mm -hmm. ending and try to figure out why Lewis had some, some other things to say after mm -hmm. the, uh, the enemy's been defeated. Okay. Well, David, uh, thanks so much uh, for uh, this very stimulating conversation. And uh, we look forward to that uh, discussion of Paralandra and, and then that hideous strength. Um, so just we got we just got a, a couple of minutes left. So um, is there anything else that you would want to say about um, the Wade Center and what you guys are doing there? And not only related to C.S. Lewis, but also. Tolkien and others. So um, some people may not be familiar with uh, your work there at the Wade Center. Okay. Uh, the Wade Center started out a very visionary professor in the 1960s, a Wheaton English professor. He uh, realized that C.S. Lewis was going to become an important figure, both in uh, apologetics and in fiction. So he started collecting Lewis's letters and first editions 
1965, which is only two years after Lewis passed. Uh, and then he said, oh, I also have an opportunity to start collecting things from Tolkien. He actually spent a summer with Tolkien working on the Cimmerillion. And then his vision grew. Well, two other inklings were Owen Barfield and Charles Williams. So maybe we should not just do Lewis and his good friend Tolkien, but let's do all four of the inklings that were there in Oxford. And then he realized that Dorothy Sayers was not an inkling, but she was a good friend of Lewis. Uh, and they had a very rich correspondence. And then after those five, he said, well, what about George MacDonald and G.K. Chesterton? They were such important literary influences. So he ended up with seven British Christians and he started collecting first editions, all the scholarship, all the letters he could find. And originally it was just a room in the main library at Wheaton. Then it outgrew that space and became a wing of the library. And then in 2001, a woman came forward named Mary Wade and said, you need your whole building to house this collection. So she built the Marion E. Wade Center in honor of her father, who was the founder of Service Master. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful space. It looks like a Cotswold cottage. And we have a museum with Lewis's wardrobe. Uh, we have both Lewis's and Tolkien's uh, writing desk, the desk that Lewis wrote the Narnia Chronicles on and the, the desk that Tolkien wrote the Lord of the Rings on. We also have Tolkien's writing pen. It's, uh, they both liked uh, a dip pen with an inkwell. They thought it gave them time to think when they were putting more ink onto the nib of the pen. For Tolkien's, we have uh, his nib pen, which has ink stains on one end, and it has tobacco stains on the other end, as he would tamp his pipe with the, uh, the pen while he was thinking about what to write next. So we have a lot of wonderful artifacts. Uh, we also have a reading room. We have all the primary works of our seven authors, virtually all of the scholarly and secondary works, including magazine articles and dissertations. We have 900 dissertations. So you could easily write your dissertation or a whole book without ever going online. It's all physically present there in the room. And uh, as I say, for Chris and I as, as co-directors, it's been especially rich experience. Uh, we have 2,400 books from Lewis's personal library, and he was quite an indexer and an underliner and an annotator. So you really get to see how he responded to famous books that he was reading. I talked earlier about Christian mysticism, uh, and one of the people who's reading named Samuel Butler said, this is a matter of rational demonstration, not mere mystical intuition. And Lewis wrote in the margin, this man is a fool. He does not understand mysticism. <laughs> so it's really fun to look at Lewis's own books from his library. Uh, also, the people we meet, we just love opportunities. I wish that we could switch out of the, uh, the cyber mode and be in the personal mode. We're all sitting in the, the auditorium in a big circle there in the Wade Center and let everybody just share their questions and their thoughts together as a group. Yeah. So it's, it's a wonderful facility. We invite everyone to come. We actually have some scholarships for people who need about $1,000 or $1,200 for travel and accommodations. If they have a scholarly project they want to work on, we do have some money available to help them uh, make the trip to the Wade Center. Great, great. Wow. Well, um, I just want to say thanks uh, to all the people who joined us tonight. This was a great discussion, and uh, you guys sent in some good questions. So uh, this is what makes it work, and we're looking forward to the next one. And so with that, uh, I would say good night and start reading Paralandra. That's right. That's right. Thanks, Bill. Good night. Good night. Thank you all for joining us. Really enjoyed it. Good questions.